often um, um, fossils are um, very much part of that. So I'm excited to um, uh, have that opportunity. So yeah, so what I'd like to do, let me um, share my screen with everyone. And um, I'm happy to take questions if even in the middle of the talk, if someone just wants to hit the raise hand button or something, that's totally fine with me. Um, if I miss it and keep going, I will see it eventually. So um, should be fine. So let me see here if I can share my screen. And we should have that up here. There we go. Okay. So um, as was said, I'm, I'm here at Towson University and I work on a bunch of different aspects of ants, but one of those um, things I um, work on are fossil ants. And in particular, I'm interested in sort of the pattern of ant diversity um, over time and what that um, sort of might tell us about um, sort of the rise and fall of different lineages within the ants and what it might tell us about their um, sort of place in the biosphere. So I always like to start by thinking about this, right? Today, ants are everywhere. It's hard to go anywhere, at least in the terrestrial world, um, and not come across ants. And, you know, you can go all the way from the high Arctic to the tropics where there'll be lots and lots of ants, and you're likely to come across some ants as you go on those journeys. And this is just something we're all familiar with with our own day-to-day -day, um, experiences, right? And so um, one of the things as a myrmecologist, as a person who studies ants, um, we always like to talk about the ways that ants dominate the earth, right? And so about a quarter of all animal biomass um, in the terrestrial world um, is comprised of ants. And in fact, the other quarter is about termites. So um, social insects make up a huge bulk of the just sheer biomass of, of um, life on earth today. And not only is um, do they sort of just numerically dominate in terms of um, biomass, but they also form really important um, parts of um, communities in the ways that they interact with that community. They form complex symbiotic relationships. This is just a picture here of some fungus growing ants, which have a complex symbiotic relationship with fungi and a number of other partners in a um, mutualism that stretches back um, tens of millions of years. Um, ants also um, dominate in the ways that they um, are major predators. If you go to the New World Tropics, uh, the largest predator um, in terms of um, it, again, it's biomass are the um, army ants um, in those um, ecosystems, not jaguars, not mountain lions, but in fact, army ants. So this idea, this over, um, over, overarching idea that ants are sort of everywhere and they occupy multiple different levels of, of biological communities and have such a profound impact on how we see diversity of life on earth today. So a simpler way to say this is ants rule the world, right? I always like to, to emphasize to my um, my entomology students, you know, we're not in the age of mammals or the age of dinosaurs or anything. We're in the age of insects, and we have been in the age of insects for about 320 some million years. But it wasn't always the case that ants dominated the landscape. In fact, you don't have to go that far back in geologic time um, to come to a point where you wouldn't have come across ants comprising 25% of the biomass on, um, in, the, in, a, in an ecosystem. Um, you'd go back about 100, 100 million years, 120 million years. It probably would have been fairly hard to find ants at that point. And so this is where fossils come in because fossils can start to inform what that sort of tempo of diversity and abundance looks like. And we're really lucky with ants because ants have a really rich fossil record. In fact, there are more species of fossil ants than there are dinosaurs um, in terms of described species. And we're finding more so there's over 700 described fossil ant species and we're finding more all the time. Um, I just wanna sort of talk just briefly about the way the different types of ant fossils that we find because the type of ant fossil actually has a big impact on the way that we, um, on what sort of ants we find in that. So the first is just, I, I just threw up a picture here, took, taking a look at some rock, rock strata because one of the places you find um, ants are as, impression fossils and rock fossils. And so here is just sort of a collection of a few species that I've worked on. Um, and rock fossils are um, 
interesting because they often are really good records of showing us places where ants were very abundant because we may come across a place where there are lots and lots of, of um, individuals that were collected in the rocks. But like anything in the fossil record, it's also important to understand the limitations. So one of the things with impression fossils, rock fossils, like you see here in print fossils, um, is that um, oftentimes, as you can see, so the preservation is not always great, right? A lot of times you can look at these and they're just kind of shadowy outlines of things. You can see some things, but other features are frequently missing or hard to see um, from the individual rock fossils. It's also to understand, important to understand the bias and what you're likely to find in rock fossils. So this is a part of the fossil record that's almost entirely going to comprise of reproductives. So it's going to be the winged males and winged females that flew off from the nest to do their mating flight that become rock fossils. And the reason is because these imprints are formed by um, a, an ant flying over a body of water and landing in that body of water and quickly becoming covered. So you're unlikely to find workers, which of course is the, the cast the, um, um, that you're most likely to see on a day-to-day -day interaction is going to be with worker ants. Um, but in rock fossils, it's mostly going to be those comprised of reproductives, males and ants, or uh, males and queens that were off on their mating flights. And that's what you see here in these pictures. You can see um, individuals with the wings in here in this um, upper left um, fossil here and so forth. So usually those are gonna be reproductives. The other major source of fossils is going to be of ant fossils and um, insects in general um, is going to be amber. And of course, amber is the fossilized, uh, um, is fossilized resin of various plants. And there's a variety of different plants which um, over the last 100 million plus years have uh, form um, amber deposits. And so um, fossilized resins are often quite different because it's in fossilized resins, the bias is very different. Here we typically find workers. So this is, we do find reproductives as well, but workers are quite common um, in this. And that makes sense because the workers would be scurrying along tree trunks or things like that tens of millions of years ago and become entrapped in the resin and, and therefore became a fossil, um, an amber fossil. So we have these sort of two separate types of deposits. We have impression or imprint fossils or rock fossils that we can talk about, and then amber fossils. Um, I'm going to um, sort of highlight both of those throughout tonight's talk. So this actually in front of you is actually the first um, Cretaceous aged ant that was discovered. And this was discovered back in 1967. Um, this is a Sphecomerma fryi, which is from the amber deposits of um, near, um, well, used to be near um, Sayreville, New Jersey. Um, and um, this was the oldest, this, this specimen was around 90, this species would have existed somewhere between 90 and 95 million years ago. And for a long time, it was the only, it was actually known from one specimen, one worker specimen, and it was the only one that was known um, at that time. I'm happy to say that since that time, there have been quite a few more Cretaceous amber fossils discovered. And in fact, we'll, I'll talk more about this in a, in, in a little bit, but um, Cretaceous ants actually turned out to be quite, have been, were quite ecologically diverse. Um, and we're learning a lot more about that period of ant evolution overall. Um, this is just showing you some of the weird examples of Cretaceous age ants that have been discovered. Um, there's a whole group of um, Cretaceous ants referred to as the uh, Hadomerma signs or sometimes called hell ants. Um, and they're called that in part because many of them have this, this is the fossil over here on the left, and you can see these really weird mandibles. And they also have these very weird spike-like structures along their, um, the upper lip or the clepias of the, um, of the uh, ant. And this is a line drawing obviously on the right-hand side. And one of the things that was really weird about these um, ants from the Cretaceous is that um, their mandibles articulated in a very different way than modern ants in that they articulated um, this sort of moved as a joint with the, the mandibles moving up towards the face. So you can sort of see it here in this diagram on the right, sort of showing you that articulation. That articulation is unlike modern ants, which actually always articulate side to side. Um, so it's a very weird articulation. It was probably used to capture prey and we think capture prey and, and literally spike them on those, those um, structures along the upper 
lip of the ant, if you will. So it's really weird lifestyle, very different than what we see in modern ants. Um, but we've learned a lot about what ants probably look like in the Cretaceous because of these, um, particularly because of Burmese amber um, fossil deposits, but there've been some um, Cretaceous A's French amber as well, and um, that have also given some insight into the diversity of ants and what they might've been doing at that um, sort of ancient time period. This is just showing another fossil of those. So again, amber can often have these very spectacular um, um, details because the specimen can, you can see a lot of features of it because it's sort of preserved in this resin, right? Sort of, it's like sort of putting it in a piece of plastic. And oftentimes you can see very um, detailed structures. The advent of micro CT scanning has actually really changed the, the study of amber as well, because even features that are hidden behind a bubble or internal features of the ant or insect, any insect um, are now visible with micro CT scanning. So actually we're even getting a clearer picture of um, some of these very ancient fossils that we see here. Um, so one of the things we know based on those Cretaceous age um, amber deposits is that um, ants were likely not the ecologically dominant insects we see today. In other words, even though there's quite a diversity of forms and we know that they were morphologically pretty diverse and presumably that means they were ecologically um, diverse as well, um, they don't seem to have been very abundant. Now, the fossil record has a lot of issues with whether or not you can always get abundance, easy to glean abundance data out um, from it. But um, uh, one of the things that um, we can say is that they just don't show up that often in the amber deposits. And so we can infer that that probably meant they weren't very, um, very dominant. It's also likely that Cretaceous ants almost exclusively occupied the leaf litter layer of the habitat, which is not a particularly great place to be if you're going to get caught in amber. So there's also that. But so we know a lot more about Cretaceous ants. Um, and we can say they, they were morphologically, presumably ecologically diverse, but probably just not as dominant as they were today, um, which is um, now, of course, the Cretaceous ended with a bang, right? We all um, know about the meteor strike that ended the non-avian dinosaurs, but also ended another a number of other important groups, including, um, well, we don't know exactly when the Hadomyrmosines disappeared, but they don't, that lineage is completely gone. There's no modern analogs. Um, to those. Um, and uh, presumably that ended with the uh, end Cretaceous event that um, took out a number of different groups of organisms as well. We're not clear. I'll come back to this point um, a little a little later um, in the talk. So one of the things that we can do is we can take a look at what are the patterns of ant diversity over time. So I mentioned that one of my interests in ant fossils is to look at how exactly ant diversity has changed over um, um, over their, their fossil record. So what we have here on this graph here, this is a, a graph from a, um, a review of ant fossils that I, I published a number of years ago. Um, and what this is sort of showing you here is a few things. One thing to notice is that this green shaded area, this is showing you um, fossil deposits that contain ants. So all of these here are showing you fossil deposits that contain ant. In the green area here, these are all Cretaceous aged. And the color of the particular um, deposit, either being this amber color or this gray color, showing you if it's a amber deposit or if it's a rock containing um, impression containing um, fossil deposit. And there's a few things to note here. And then this shows you over here the proportion of all ants, um, the, the number, the proportion of ants that are in that deposit in proportion to all the other insects that are known from that fossil deposit. So it gives us a rough proxy. And again, this is nothing more than a rough proxy of how abundant the ants were relative to the other insects that were also captured in that particular um, fossil deposit. This blue and purplish color here, this is all Cenozoic. So this is all um, more modern era stuff. And one of the trends you can see right away by looking at this, um, this graph here is that um, ants starting around the Eocene period, so around 45 million years ago, um, suddenly become much more abundant, uh, much more higher proportions of the total number of individuals found in fossil deposits. They're relatively rare in Cretaceous um, age deposits, and from the Eocene onward become um, important components, 
usually comprising between 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 percent the number of insect fossils found in that particular um, deposit. And we think that reflects that it was around the Eocene that ants sort of reached the level of ecological dominance that we see today. I um, mean, in fact, I'll come back to this point, but um, the Eocene is a really important part of, of um, ant evolution because it's also in that period where most of the modern groups and lineages emerge and sort of, in fact, the Eocene ant fauna wouldn't have been that different than the fauna that we see today. Um, um, so anyway, this is what this is sort of highlighting here, that sort of change. So when we take a look at ant fossils, we can ask a number of interesting questions. And of course, one of the questions that sort of intrigues uh, biologists and non-biologists alike about many groups of organisms is just how old they are. And so the fossil record can help inform some of that. Um, in terms of giving us potential um, ages of particular uh, of particular groups. So we can ask the question, how old are the ants? Well, what we can say from the fossil record, if we're just exclusively looking at the fossil record, is that the oldest definitive ant fossils are no older than 100 million years old. So, um, you know, as insect groups go, as insect families go, in, um, ants are not particularly old, actually, which is kind of interesting to think about given how um, dominant they are today. Um, they're old, but they're not that old. Many groups of um, um, families of insects are significantly older than this, so they um, are relatively newcomers. And it really is only, you know, for the first half of their existence, they seem to have been not the dominant creatures that we see today on the earth. So it's really only from about 45 million years onward that they reach that sort of um, ecological dominance that we sort of see today. Now, there's a bunch of ways you can infer ages of groups. And um, um, one of the ways, of course, is using fossil records, but fossils are inherently biased in that fossils always give us the minimum date, right? So they're sort of saying, well, there was a fossil that we found that's 100 million years old, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's you know, how old it is because the group, that fossil came from somewhere, that individual lineage came from somewhere. And so there are a number of different ways that you can sort of infer. And one of the popular ways now is to look at various ecological, or sorry, various molecular estimates. And there's a variety of different ways you can do this, different programs and, 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 and such to sort of um, take molecular data, so that is taking DNA, taking the, you know, the long um, string of A, T's, G's, and C's that make up the DNA of organisms, and using that information with a, a variety of different models to say, can we get estimates of the age based on what the molecules are telling us? And I just threw in here some, um, some studies. These are, are um, studies from a while ago now, and, and um, these dates have been are still coming at about the same for most molecular um, data. But this is just two studies sh sort of showing you a range of, of dates. So one study um, was showing a range of ants saying that ants go back 140 to 165 million years. Um, another study um, looking at molecular data was saying um, ranging back to 115 to 135 million years, um, but also putting some of those other groups, those um, Cretaceous age groups, pushing that maybe back a bit further. So this is sort of what the um, molecular dates um, have to tell us. So one of the things that is um, frustrating, and I'll come back to this point at the end of the presentation in the ant fossil record, is that there are a number of insect rich early Cretaceous fossil deposits, I have them listed here, that do not contain ants. Now, um, that could mean that the conditions were such that just ants didn't fossilize well, but it also could suggest that ants didn't exist at that time. So, you know, when we take things like those molecular estimates, look at the oldest known fossils, we also want to look at where don't we see things as well, right? Because that can be instructive um, as well to say, well, we look at these other deposits from around the world, we don't see ants in there. Does that mean that they just weren't there or were they rare and just didn't fossilize in those deposits? What does that sort of mean overall? So um, this, by the way, is called divergence dating. Um, and there's a variety of different ways you can do it. It's become very popular if you look at the literature um, nowadays uh, across a variety of different organisms. You'll see that um, um, scientists increasingly try to figure out ages and dates um, for different lineages. 
and how that works. I mean, geez, we even see it in real time now, right? The reason we're here on Zoom is because of COVID and you could even do diver divergence dating with COVID and when different lineages of COVID and things like that have emerged. So there's a, obviously that's a much more shorter compressed time frame we're talking about there, but it's the same basic idea. Uh, when we stretch back in time, so molecular data, of course, inherently is based on just living taxa. So those living species that we're getting the DNA from. And then what we usually do is what we call, we try to calibrate parts of that tree. So what we do is we say, okay, if we can look at the phylogenetic tree, that set of relationships we've um, created with that molecular data, can we then go and look at what fossils can we put onto those where we see that splitting occur. So we can say, oh, here's a split. Can we put a little fossil on there to do what we call calibrate it? In other words, to allow us to take that molecular data and say, well, we know that this lineage of ants existed 50 million years ago. And we know that because there's a fossil that's of that lineage that existed 50 million years ago. So that's called divergence dating. One of the problems is that, um, so we usually do what we say, single node calibration. So we try to find where those splits are and put those um, dates on there um, using that. And then using our model of molecular evolution, we can use those dates and ho hopefully get a better idea of how old and get those estimates of how old different groups are. So let me give you an example though, because often it's not unusual for the molecular um, data and the fossil data to actually diverge quite a bit. And there's some, it's actually, I'm not going to get too much into the weeds here for this group, but there's some really interesting reasons as to why that might be happening. And I'm, I'm particularly intrigued as to why that might be happening. Um, but let me just give a few examples of where we get information from fossil records and how that might change our understanding of different um, groups of ants. So I want to start here with the paper that in 2015 estimated the um, age of this genus Campanotus ants being between 23 and 27 million years um, old. You all know Campanotus because these are carpenters. So many there are several species of these that we would call carpenter ants. Um, Car Campanotus is much more than just carpenter ants, but the ones that you're likely to have interacted with are um, carpenter ants. It's a, this is a genus of about a thousand species, so it's a, it's a big group of ants. Um, I worked on a, so this is just showing you a variety of different Campanota species today um, um, that exist. Um, one of the characteristics of them is that they're dimorphic, so they often have a major cast and a minor cast. Um, not all species have that, but many of them do. Um, so I worked on a, a fossil deposit from um, the Eocene known as the Kishinine fossils, which is about um, uh, 50 million years old. And um, I discovered this, members of this sort of shadowy fossil here, which is sometimes called Camponotides. And everyone, you, whenever you see this name, um, I-T-E-S at the end of a name, that usually means paleontologists aren't quite sure where to put it, that it sort of fits kind of modern groups, but not quite. Um, and so um, this would suggest that those molecular dates are off by about 25 million years-ish. Um, because these fossils are much older, but then there's also the question, are they really Camponotus or not sort of things. And those are kind of the questions that when you look at fossils, you sort of, um, um, you grapple with. You know, one of the things that is important to remember with the fossil record, when we look at modern species, things living today, they have all the features that we use to define them as belonging to that group. But that's because we're defining them by the features that they possess today. When we step back in the fossil record, given that evolution happens and given that traits are, are very unlikely to occur all at once, right? We come across little beasts that have some of the features of modern groups, but not all of those features. And that can sort of um, make fossils, I think, kind of exciting to look at, but also make their placement challenging um, in terms of where they sort of go. So, you know, what does the fossil record say? So it just sort of, um, this is just some sort of notes I had looking at this Campanotis group. Um, we know that there's Baltic amber, um, that also, um, which is um, about 40 million years ago, that has a species of Campanotus um, in it. Um, if it is a Campanotus, it says that our molecular date estimate is too young. Um, if on the other hand, this Baltic amber fossil is not, um, doesn't belong to modern day Campanotus, um, it would mean that the molecular estimate may be correct. And then, like I said, with fossils all the time, you have to question, is the placement that we have it in accurate. In other words, 
Is there other data we can glean from it to maybe change where we would put that group? And that would obviously have important implications for using that fossil in any sort of dating analysis as well. Um, I work with a group of ants called Acropyga that I'm particularly interested in. In fact, I gave a talk to this group of, I guess last year or something on Acropyga. Um, and um, those differences between molecular dates and, and fossil dates have encountered with my group. This is a group of ants, by the way, that enters into these symbiotic relationships with mealybugs. And um, it's a really interesting um, um, uh, symbiotic relationship between these groups. They seem to have co-evolved with each other. And so I'm very interested in how old these different groups are. So we did a molecular estimate and our molecular estimates of the Acropyga came out to about saying that the crown group, that modern group of Acropyga is about 30 million years old. Um, and so it gives us sort of that estimate that we um, can sort of look at by using those molecules. So we can ask the question is what does the fossil record suggest? Well, this is an Acropyga species from Dominican amber. Here's the queen right here. Um, and she's actually holding a mealybug. One of the cool things about these Acropyga is they, the queens actually take a mealybug from their birth nest, fly off and use that mealybug to start a new nest. Um, but here she is holding a mealybug captured in the amber. Here's the male that she was presumably mating with. So it wasn't a great day for them, but good for us. We get to sort of look at this fossil. Um, and one of the things that's interesting, again, thinking about that fossil record, what does that sort of tell us? Well, this fossil is about 15 to 20 million years old. So in this case, our molecular estimate is older than that um, fossil record that we would, um, than what we see. So again, just sort of highlighting some of these um, differences that we can get between uh, modern molecular dating um, and that fossil record um, that we see here. So one of the things that's sort of interesting is, you know, nowadays we generate these huge molecular data sets um, that will be comprised of hundreds of thousands of base pairs worth of data, sometimes millions of base pairs worth of data, depending on what we're looking at. But our calibration methods are usually still very much dependent on calibrating nodes and typically those calibration of those nodes is taking place with one fossil species. So, and that's just an artifact of the fossil record itself. And that has um, important implications. One of the things that's important is that the fossil taxonomy is off, oftentimes woefully out of date. And that is true in ants too. Much of um, the ant fossils, much of those 700 plus species I've talked about that have been described, um, many of them were described a hundred plus years ago. And so, um, and they haven't been sort of re-examined in any using any modern techniques or even with a modern sense of, of, of um, how ants evolved and the different lineages of ants. So um, that can present some real difficulty. So I think one of the um, disconnects right now in with divergence dating is there's lots of molecular data, but there needs to be a lot more um, emphasis worked on looking at those fossils and making sure they're up to date and that we can accurately use them in our analyses. Um, but I actually think there's hope for doing this and actually getting more accurate sense of how old groups are um, and using fossils in a really productive way, and in particular for ants. And there's a, a number of reasons for this, not least because there are lots of ant fossils, but also because there's quite a few people, um, we're kind of in, an, in a renaissance of ant um, um, paleontology right now. Um, and um, there's quite a bit of work going on trying to understand the ant fossil record and see what that can tell us about modern um, groups as well. Um, so again, if we go back to looking at this um, chart that I showed earlier, this again is showing us that distribution of ant, of fossil deposits that contain ants over time. So it's giving us all of the major um, deposits stretching back from the um, lower Cretaceous all the way to the Miocene um, that we see here. And, um, one of the things that, of course, is important, so one of the things that I've focused on, and I'm going to sort of um, emphasize here, is that I've tended to focus on, um, there's a lot of people working on Cretaceous um, ants right now, and Cretaceous ants are really interesting um, because they have these really weird morphologies, and they tell us something about early ant evolution, but I'm actually particularly interested in Cenozoic ants, so more modern ants, ants at the, um, the, from the Paleocene onward, and the reason for that is because it's in those fossil deposits that are most likely to give us, be instructive about when the modern ant fauna that we see today, when that sort of emerged, what lineages emerged first, 
um, and in what parts of the world they emerge first and those kinds of questions. So I've been particularly interested in um, fossil deposits from the Eocene and the Oligocene period. I just wanna sort of point out too that, you know, stretching back, this is from the middle Eocene. So this is what the earth, approximation of what the earth would have looked like about 50 million years ago. And again, just like it's important to remember that when we look at fossils, we're looking at organisms that have some, but not necessarily all the features of modern groups. It's also important to keep in mind that when we look at a fossil deposit, that where it is today is not necessarily where it was at the time that the specimens were actually deposited in that, what would become that fossil deposit. Um, and so this is just showing you um, those fossil deposits I talked about and some of the distribution of what they would have looked like um, from the um, Eocene period um, in particular. Again, showing you where those areas would have been and what those um, um, places may have looked like at that time may have been quite different what they look, than what they look like today. Um, so I've, like I said, I've become interested in a, um, a series of fossil deposits from the Eocene and in particular um, um, deposits from uh, North America. And I just wanna sort of highlight one of them. This graph here is just showing you one of the things that's interesting. This one through nine here is showing you a number of Eocene aged fossil deposits that contain ants um, stretching from um, the Canadian Rockies down into um, um, Arkansas, actually, we're talking about Arkansas amber there, um, that's sort of in this period. So there's actually a number of interesting um, Eocene aged and Eocene Oligocene boundary aged um, fossil deposits across North America that have ants in them. And one of the ones that I um, have become interested in and, and have worked on is a deposit known as the Kishinim. This is um, a fossil deposit. It's actually really insect rich, it contains a number of um, different insect groups. This fossil deposits from um, north what today from northwestern Montana. It's approximately 46 million years old. And I looked at a number of ant specimens that came from this deposit. So here, just some of the data looking at this, 249 specimens were looked at. Um, I could get about 152 of those to at least subfamily level. And we described, um, I worked on this with um, uh, um, someone from the Smithsonian. We described uh, 12 fossil um, species from this deposit. And it contains some of the oldest representatives of two extant, so two living genera, that is the genus Chromatogaster and the genus Pseudomyrmex. And we found a new genus, a kind of morphologically unusual um, genus from a, um, one of the dominant subfamilies of ants today. Um, this genus doesn't exist any longer, but did exist back in the Eocene. So I just sort of thought I would throw some of these out just to show some uh, pretty uh, pictures of fossils. So one of the things that uh, a lot of rock fossils of ants, the Kishinin was very interesting because um, they were on um, very thin shales. And so the um, the fossils um, themselves were these nice imprints, oops, um, that we can see here um, that we, and you could often see pretty fine details. Again, not like what we see in amber, which really looks like it could be something modern. You could sort of pull it out and, and, and look at all the details of it. But um, this deposit did contain a number of really good um, uh, specimens that were able to see quite a few features. This is Chromatogaster aurora, a species we described. Chromatogaster is another group of ants you probably have interacted with. If you've ever seen little aphids on your rose bushes or plants in your garden or something, and they're tended by ants, they're often tended by um, this genus called Chromatogaster. Um, up until this point, the only other chromatogaster fossil was a male specimen from Sicilian amber, which is much younger, only about 16 to 23 million years old. Um, and this genus in most recent sort of molecular estimate came in at under 42 million years. So here again, we have a fossil um, that's 46 to 50 million years old. So again, older than those um, molecular estimates. Um, and I am willing to, to, to go to bat that this really is a modern day chromatogaster. So um, some people have contended that maybe it's not quite crown group, but I actually disagree. And I, um, I won't get into why for our purposes here, but there are lots of features of this, which I think show that it is a modern, belongs to modern group. This is another one, Pseudomyrmex, another genus where um, um, this is now the oldest known fossil from that. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. There is a species note from the Florissant um, fossils, which is a, a nearby deposit to the Kishinin, a few million years younger. Um, 
this is a genus that's really well known in, in um, by Miocene times in Dominican amber, and the Dominican amber deposits actually shows up quite frequently. In fact, 11 species are known from that um, deposit um, that we can see here. This is just showing you that um, morphologically. So one of the things that fossils are also good at showing us are when we look at modern groups, um, you know, we have our collection of, of taxa that make up those modern groups, but when we step in the fossil record, we can often see unusual combinations of features. So in other words, features that existed in the distant past, like in this case, in this 46 million year old um, um, group that we call Tunisia, um, that, um, that we just don't see combinations among modern, among modern um, members of this um, uh, subfamily. So again, it can be interesting looking at morphological evolution, what features we can see in the past, but don't today, things like that. So we can ask a number of um, interesting questions along uh, with that. One of the things, if I go back to this chart again, that's interesting is that, um, so here we have the fossil deposits from the Cretaceous that I mentioned. Here's our Cenozoic deposits, but there's actually this very annoying gap that exists. And it exists between um, sort of the end Cretaceous and the Paleocene. It's about a 23 million year gap where there just are no ant fossils. And the reason I say that's annoying, of course, is because a rather important event happened at the end Cretaceous. And so we don't know many of these Cretaceous age lineages, which show up in these Cretaceous age amber deposits, we don't know when exactly they disappeared. So the Sphecomermines, this ancient group of ants, um, are no longer present and they don't show up in any modern day, any Cenozoic um, deposit, but when exactly did they go extinct? Did they go extinct before the end Cretaceous event? Did they go extinct soon after? We don't know because there is this kind of what we commonly call the Paleocene gap that exists within the ant fossil record. And this gappiness, right, is, and you, you're all fossil people, you know, know this already, right, this gappiness in different lineages, fossil records is not unusual, right? Where you'll have sort of conspicuous gaps um, in there. But I am excited to say that I'm working on a project right now with um, um, Phil Barden up at NJIT, um, um, where we're trying to fill in some of the things of this, of this gap. Um, this is from a paper a few years ago. This was a fossil that Phil Barden and I described um, called Napakimurma pascapuensis. Um, which is actually a Paleocene ant. And actually it's the first, um, the oldest um, Cenozoic ant um, that's known that existed between 60, oops, um, existed between 60 and uh, 56 million years ago. Um, and here is the, what the fossil looks like. It's known from one single worker specimen. And if you can't see it, I put a picture in here highlighting um, what it would have looked like, sort of a reconstruction of this. This is an interesting fossil, not least because it's um, from the Paleocene. So this is from a formation up in Alberta, Canada. But it also um, is interesting because it belongs to a subfamily of ants that used to be widespread across the world. And today is actually only known from a single species of ant found in two forest remnants in Sri Lanka. So it's actually one of these interesting groups that used to be really widespread has become very restricted in modern times. Um, and so um, it made its sort of fossil discovery of another member of this um, sort of uh, interesting here. Um, this also sort of shows you what I mean by sort of the fossil taxonomy being out of date. This fossil was actually mentioned in a paper for, in 1979. Um, but no one actually, it was mentioned that there was an ant, but no one actually took a close look at the fossil. So um, Phil and I in um, 2000, when did we, when was this paper? 2015, um, when we, we took a closer look at this fossil that had been seen in 1979 um, and, and figured we could actually um, do some um, do some work up with it. So again, it sort of shows that sort of disparity that often, um, that often exists. Okay, and I think with that, that concludes my presentation talking about ant fossils. So I'm happy to um, take any questions that folks uh, might have or um, things that you might need clarification on. So thanks so much for, for hearing me out and getting a chance to hear about ant fossils. And I think I see a, a hand up, Edwin. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic, well, first of all, excellent presentation. I'm gonna have to get you over at Morgan State to give this to my class. Oh, okay. Um, I'd yeah. be happy to. 
other than than that gap that you notice, there's another thing that shows up in the Eocene, and that's like a substitution between or or a lack thereof uh, of any amber fossils, according to your graph. <laughs> and, and I'm wondering whether that is uh, related to the to the ants or to other environmental factors. Um, it's probably just related to just the distribution of where, you know, amber happened to form. Um, so um, in the, basically in the Cenozoic, if there's a decent amber deposit, there's going to be ants in it. Um, so that just really reflects, again, it's kind of that gappiness in some of the, the record, right? So amber is one of those things where it had to be the right species of, of tree in the right mm -hmm. abundance. And then that fought, then that resin had to be under the conditions, you know, the high pressure conditions that would have caused it to go through amberification, and um, that sort of um, conditions are not always really common. Do you know what I mean? So that's one of the things that just sort of happened um, in there. But yeah, that you're, you're absolutely right that that's one of those um, it's one of those things that yeah we get these sort of gaps that sort of occur there. Thank you. Do you see another question? There. That's yes. me. This is Bron. This is Bronwyn. Thank you so much, um, uh, John. This is wonderful. My question was that just on amber itself, and you said that they're amber deposit. Um, mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit on 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 what an amber deposit is, how it would be formed, and where we would find you know, them. are there any amber deposits in Maryland, for instance? Well, so that's a good question. Are there any amber deposits? So in terms of the actual process, you know, it's, it's like I said, it requires a, a plant that's produce a resinous producing plant, first of all. So not all plants obviously do that. So it, it needs to be a plant that's doing that. And then the, the, the plant itself has to have a certain chemical profile that if it's, if that resin is sort of put under high pressure, that it will go through this process of, of amberfication. Um, that's the extent of what I know about how amber forms. But um, so again, that that is not necessarily something which is going to happen frequently. In some places, like in, in areas of the Baltics, there's a big Baltic amber deposit. There were forests there that that did that. Dominic Hispanola is the same thing. Dominican amber. There were certain trees. Um, I forget. There's one dominant tree that I'm forgetting. Hymenia or something. Um, that was dominant, that became the main amber producing, what would become the main amber producing tree um, uh, that we would see there. Your question, is there amber in Maryland? Um, I don't think so. But the reason I'm hedging a little bit um, is that um, it's probably the case that there's actually a lot of Cretaceous amber across the East Coast. It's just most of it's probably super deep. So we would never come across it, even if we find it. And the reason I say that is because in New Jersey amber, which is um, from a location in, outside Sayreville, actually was discovered when they were making a shopping center, right? And so they were digging it up. It just happens that there, that the the amber there, and there's again, this is I'm not a geologist. I'm a I wouldn't even call myself a paleo paleontologist. I'm sort of uh, you know a, a posing as one, but um, but in, in that sort of case, um, what sort of um, happened, it just has happened to be that the amber was at the relatively close to the surface, but I've talked to actual paleo real paleontologists and they seem to think that they're probably likely there's a lot of amber. I just saw something recently where someone may have come across amber from North Carolina that's likely Cretaceous age. I, I haven't followed up much more on that, but again, there it's there's probably stuff down there, but it might be a mile deep. Right, so a lot of it might just be so deep that we'll ne we're never going to actually see it, um, and that you know is probably true for a lot of fossil stuff. Right, it's just like the reason why we don't see fossils a lot in the tropics. There's some good reasons for that. Some of it just because it's piled under a bunch of vegetation, and we're just never. It's just not easy to find. To find, right? Um, so you know things like that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I see Fred has a hand up too. Hi, John. Good evening. Hey, uh, thank, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I had a question about the Montana deposit. Is this the place where you have to pack in like miles? It takes a couple of days 
journey to almost very, very far inland along the river where the cliff is exposed and the fossils are there and they're apparently very highly preserved uh, small fossils, all of them, but. Yeah, so this, so I've never been to the site myself. Um, uh, Dale Greenwall is the person that I've worked with at um, Smithsonian on Kishinin. That's um, who I thought you were gonna say. Yeah, so Dale is yeah, the person, Dale, yeah. he, he's sort of the Kishinin <laughs> expert. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, he's done several seasons of field work out there. I don't know what the field conditions are like. It, look, it looks like, you know, pictures of, you know, are, it's a beautiful location and it is along a river again, which is a common place, right? Because the river sort of exposes these, um, creates these exposures um, um, there. But yeah, I don't know much about that um, in terms of its actual, you know, the physical, what the modern conditions are of it. Uh, but the, the level of preservation is actually pretty remarkable for insects of a rock containing deposit. Yeah. So Dale's done things like, you know, he described what a mosquito, where he was able to do like a chemical analysis of the blood um, that was from the rock and things like that, which is pretty remarkable. Right. But um, so he's been able to do a bunch of sort of things. Yeah, they, they found the uh, hemoglobin from it. Yeah. Well, the, heme, the heme itself with the iron, they detected that. Right. And, yeah, that, that was pretty remarkable. I actually had, had him speak for the MES meeting some years ago on that, okay. not that long back. Yeah, so I, that's how I knew about this. But apparently there's tons of material that you guys can study still that's not even been fully looked at, I think, right? Because they, they, they were able to get quite a bit and I guess they can go back and get more. The, the site is very rich. Yeah, Dale has a lot. The lot, I haven't actually talked to Dale in a, in a, in a couple of years. But last time I talked to him, they were having some, there was some sort of issue with um, some sort of bureaucratic issue between <laughs> between the collecting and where it was going and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I don't know what the status of all of that is, but um, but yeah, I'm sure he's come across. Yeah, that may have to do with fossils. And, yeah. Yeah, you know, some clamping that. down there with fossil collecting in general in the West. Right. Maybe, right. maybe it has to do with that, I guess. It, yeah, I don't know. It, I think it was also partly Smithsonian stuff, and I, I'm not entirely sure what the what the, what okay. the deal was. You you mentioned Cretaceous deposits in Maryland, and uh, there are quite a lot, but they're under development, as you pointed out. I know that, for example, some beautiful Cretaceous material came out of the foundation of a Heckinger's that was put up many years ago, and it's now... Um, something else they've that's long gone it's were these amber, were these amber no bones? no 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 there were um ammonites some dinner plate size ammonites right. that came out of there that were phenomenal and um other things like that from that type of material but further uh, closer to dc along that 95 corridor is where a lot of cretaceous deposits happen to be um there, there must be something in there. I know there was one gentleman I met, um, and I can't remember his name, but he had a nice collection of teeth. Mm. Of, uh, I, I guess they were small dinosaurs. They were little teeth, about maybe, uh, I don't know, half an inch to a little bit larger from a Cretaceous deposits along a riverbank. I, I bet somebody here might know what I'm talking about because I can't remember the details on it. But in any case, uh, those are places that may harbor some amber that you were speaking about. And I don't know if anybody's ever found any, but um, there's a few exposures of this place and people may still be able to get in there and look for teeth. That's what most people will spot readily. The ambers are usually pretty small and harder to, to spot if there were any there, that is. Yeah, my my sense of, is with um, with amber in general is that um, there's usually very specific conditions that people look for to see if. Again, I'm not a geologist, um, so I'm I'm not sure what those are, but that they look for to sort of get signatures that there's likely to be amber there. But I see that um, I see Jillian said has had had their hand up yes. too. Yeah, I was wondering um, what is the timeline between the evolution of the ants and other hymenopterans. I know that, that bees appeared probably during the Cretaceous, um, but what about wasps? Like, do they share, like, did 
bees and ants derived from wasps or? Yeah, so, you know, wasp phylogenetically speaking is not really a meaningful term because wasps is, are basically everything that's not an ant or a bee um, in a sense. So um, it's, it, but yes, I mean, you can think about ants basically as ground dwelling wasp, right? They've become wingless and they're not even entirely wingless because the reproductives still fly, but um, at least for a period. Um, but they're basically wingless ground dwelling wasp, right? That have sort of become eusocial and entered that sort of um, um, th that niche. Um, um, ants and bees are are um, sort of belong to a larger grouping of hymenopterans. They're they're you know they're closely related. Um, I'm actually not sure how old the I haven't been up on the bee literature recently in terms of in relation to the ants, but I think that's right that they're. I mean, bees in particular, because they're so closely linked to um, flowers and flowering plants, track a little bit more the sort of rise of angiosperms. Um, but um, but yeah, that's, I don't know if that really answers do the you question. Think it's yeah. pos do you think it's possible that ants evolved uh, a greater diversity and numbers because of the angiosperm? Um, yeah, so I saw there's a question here asking about that too, about the appearance of different plant types. You know, there's been, you know, everybody in the literature wants to link every group's rise to the um, to the rise of angiosperms. And actually, there's 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 a various ways methodologically you can actually do that. Um, I personally actually have problems with the way that those methodologies run because, well they're actually biased towards always saying that, yeah, it's because of the endosperms, but um, it's more correlation rather than causation that they're showing between that. If, you know, people have claimed that ants became more diverse as angiosperms evolved because the leaf litter would have become more diverse. And there probably is some truth to that. You know, as the forest changed from more coniferous based forest and thing like, things like that, you know, coniferous forests are not great for ants. Like in general, the soils tends to become too acidic. It's not particularly great for, it's not particularly great for some litter dwelling insects in general. There are some real exceptions to that, but in general, it's not. So the rise of angiosperms kind of makes sense given that so many ants dwell in leaf litter, um, that that would have been one of the things that sort of sparked their diversification. Um, yeah, so I mean that it it could make sense that that sort of happens. It, it, it's just that the group emerges as around the same time that angiosperms are sort of beginning to take off. So it's again, was it angiosperms that did that, or were they already kind of there and and just kind of ha so it's it, it's that's an open question. But but there's no doubt that as angiosperm forests dominated the globe, those leaf litter have become more diverse. That is going to almost it has to in some way affect it, um, ant diversity. That said, you know, if we look at the fossil record, and again, this is not necessarily always a great proxy, but ants become really abundant in fossils, the fossil record from the Eocene onward. Angiosperms were already the dominant plant type way before that. So, um, you know, how it's linked, I'm not sure what, you know, in terms in, um, in terms of that, but it really is the modern ant fauna emerges in the Eocene. At that point, angiosperms were firmly ensconced as sort of the dominant plant group that we see today. Um, so anyway, any other questions out there? John, have you looked at Baltic amber at all? I know it's a little older than the period you were interested in. Yeah, I've looked at some Baltic amber. There's quite a few people who already, you know, I, I've tended to gravitate towards um, deposits where there's not people working on this. Baltic amber has been a little bit more well studied. Um, there's a lot of European scientists who um, work on that. So it's it's kind of an area I haven't spent quite as much time looking. Um, right. And the amber community, there's kind of a separate amber. I because one of the I didn't actually throw any of the slides in here, but one of the I'm working on another deposit called Canyon Ferry, which is also from Montana. Um, it's a little bit younger than Kishinin, um, and um, it's another rock fossil deposit. So that's just kind of one of the things you know. In the among paleomyrmecologists, there is some real bias. Most people hate rock fossils, and it makes sense because they're hard to see. They're not 
Um, many of the specimens are very poorly preserved. You can't do any of this micro CT scanning that you can do with amber. Um, I always contend though that it's they're still worth studying because if you ignore them, you're ignoring more than half of the ant fossils that are known. So it's sort of, yeah, there's no doubt that amber fossils are nicer to look at in general. That is definitely true. Um, but I also think that you're ignoring a big part of the fossil record by not looking at um, rock fossils. But, you know, myrmecologists debate about this kind of stuff. I think I see I have, another. Uh, one more. Yeah, it's, it's me again. Um, my, my other question is, is there any anyone actively going into natural history collections um, and seeing what's been overlooked, what's been you know in there? I know that we were just contacted by um, folks in the University of uh, Southern Mississippi doing DNA um, study on saw uh, on sawfish rostrum. So we were able to go into our collections and and give samples out for that. I have you know we might have we might have some the missing paleo gap uh, 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 ant in our collection. It, it could be out there somewhere. So I'm just curious, is there any active um, people going in and looking at collections because there could be something out there? Well, sure. I mean, some of, you know, like the um, the the Paleocene um, ant that I mentioned from the uh, Pascapu formation, um, that, you know, was a collection, right? So, I mean, I, I didn't visit it myself, but I reached out to the collection manager and got the specimens. Um, in fact, all the paleontology stuff I do is collections based. I mean, I don't actually go out and collect any of my own fossils um, myself. The Kishinin stuff is, is material Dale has collected and is at Smithsonian. Um, this Canyon Ferry is at the uh, Museum of the Rockies at um, Montana State. So, um, you know, that's all collections based. But yeah, I mean, there's some really good, um, the Smithsonian is a great example. Um, Smithsonian has a fantastic Dominican amber collection. Um, that's largely been not looked at. So for instance, that little Acropyga fossil I showed you, I know there's actually many, not many, but there's several more specimens of it in the um, Smithsonian um, um, Dominican Amber collection. Um, so things like that, there's just, yeah, I think there's, there's quite a bit of material in various collections, no doubt. Um, you know, to, you know, it's always those overlooked, you know, overlooked things, the, the place up at the University of Alberta you know, no one had, they have a paleontology collection, but no one had looked at the ant specimen in 40 years. So, um, you know, just one of those, one of those things, but yeah, absolutely. Collections are hugely important for this whole endeavor um, to understand this. Any other questions? Well, thanks everyone. Thank you, John. That was super interesting. Really enjoyed that. Great talk. And Good for question. everybody who is still interested in, in eusocial insects, um, we do have a presentation tomorrow night by Jody Johnson on uh, a project that she worked on, which is elephants and honeybees project in sub-Saharan Africa. So setting up, uh, apparently, if you, if it's like rock, paper, scissors, but if you were doing um, uh, elephants and bees, the bees beat the elephant in that. So. Uh, to come in and you can RSVP for that to get the, the Zoom link uh, emailed to you. It's going to be a fascinating presentation um, on, on that tomorrow evening on our Must Learn Thursday series. But that's it for me. I'll turn it back over to Matthew uh, to close us out. Yeah, <laughs> that's I think that's all that we need to say. Thank you so much, John. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Uh, this talk has been recorded. Fortunately, Bronwyn remembered. Uh, I might, I'd like to think that I would have remembered, but I didn't have to because she did it. And it will be up on our YouTube channel probably within a day or two. Uh, so if you want, you want to share that with your colleagues or anyone or distribute that link, that's fine too. Um, I appreciate that so much. That was really interesting. And I, I now I'm gonna spend like a little bit more time looking at the ants in my garden next time I go out and just thinking about the history behind them. Thank you. Awesome. Thank Is you. Everyone. Have a good else night. that we need to talk about? Thank you. Thank you.